This video is brought to you by NVIDIA who are giving away an RTX 3080 Founders Edition. That's pretty good. Check the link in the description below for a chance to win. There's a quote I heard a long time ago and I forget where I heard it or who said it, but it goes something like this. Making games is impossible. It sounds weird, but what this person was saying is that if you really understood what goes into making a video game, especially the AAA behemoths, if you really understood all the moving parts and the interdependencies and the technologies and how everything needs to be clicked together with such precision and in such strict sequence where one issue could cause massive ripple effects that upset the whole endeavor, if you understood all of that, you'd be like, well, that's impossible, can't be done. And yet, somehow it gets done. Thousands of times each year, game makers work together, or sometimes alone, to create these unique, unforgettable experiences in this weird and ever-evolving art form we call video games. Some of the best visual design you'll find lives in this art form. Some of the best music, some of the best stories, some of the best performances. And all of this is combined and somehow made playable in a way that no other medium is remotely capable of. It feels kind of dumb then that we take these monumental artistic and technological achievements and slap numbers on them and then rank them based on how good we think they were. I mean, we do it because it's fun and because talking about games can often be just as interesting as playing games. But we have to agree that putting the best this medium has to offer onto a big ass list and force ranking them is kind of dumb. So as long as we're on the same page and we all agree that this is a little bit dumb, then ladies and gentlemen, I give you the top 10 games of 2020. I didn't really enjoy Horizon Zero Dawn the first time I played it. I mean, I did, it was fun and all. It had cool robot dinosaurs that you shot with a bow and arrow and they'd explode, leaving chunks of debris everywhere. Yeah, it was, it was definitely cool, but I got over it really fast. I think I maybe put 10 hours or so into it before just being worn down by its open worldiness. I remember looking at the map just filled with markers and thinking, yeah, I don't know about this. I remember that the story wasn't really popping off at that point either and I was just getting kind of bored. I think the bigger issue though was that Horizon Zero Dawn released four days before Breath of the Wild and love it or hate it, Breath of the Wild absolutely changed the way we view open world games. After that, I just remember having no desire to go back to Horizon Zero Dawn because it felt kind of old and outdated, so I didn't. I moved on and that was the end of that chapter. Fast forward to 2020, the game is coming out on PC. I think to myself, hey, look at that, maybe now's my chance. Not much else coming out in August. I probably won't like it, but I'll give it a crack. I am so, so glad I did. I love this game now. Horizon Zero Dawn is like Dino Riders meets Uncharted meets Monster Hunter World meets The Matrix. It's like my eight-year-old brain is watching Saturday morning cartoons while I'm taking down robot dinosaurs and flying through fortresses that have more RGB than a QuakeCon LAN hall. It's like I'm right back in the mix with Nathan Drake as I'm scaling cliffs and swinging down rope lines. It's like I'm deep in the monster hunt, all alone in the frozen tundra with nothing but my weapon and my wits to rely on as a mechanical polar bear the size of a schoolhouse comes barreling towards me. Horizon Zero Dawn is a rare coming together of incredible action and world building that continues to surprise you as you hack through the thick plating of bullshit that seems determined to obscure the greatness that lies beneath. Because yes, there is so much goddamn bullshit in this game, holy shit. Almost every part of the game has some sort of aggravating design issue that's gonna piss you off at least a little bit, maybe a lot. Side quest design, resource collection, inventory management, collectibles, pacing, story delivery, melee combat, enemy AI, skill tree progression, and the endless, endless looting. The issues are so numerous that the entire experience becomes this game of Russian roulette where you're just hoping that the next issue you bump into isn't the one that puts a bullet in your love of the game. I personally survived the game of Russian Roulette. The bullet never went in the chamber and as a result I emerged from the other side of this experience loving it and really grateful that I played it. As an open world game, Horizon Zero Dawn is the map marker driven Ubisoft style game you think it is, but it's also so much more than that. It's stunningly beautiful, with gorgeous landscapes that set the tone for each chapter of the tale. The character designs and animations are also interesting. The enemy mech designs are just incredible, like you, you want a statue of each of them sitting on your desk. And the writing, though poorly paced and often obscured by the need to sit and listen to holotapes, is consistently excellent, slowly drip feeding you the puzzle pieces you'll need to put together to learn how the world fell to ruin and your place in all of it. But the real thing that sold me on this was the combat. I'm of a view that Horizon Zero Dawn has 
the best combat I've experienced in an open world game, a genre that so often fails to deliver quality combat. The foundation is the enemy design and the AI, which are each programmed with such ferocity that you never feel like you're in control of an engagement. You always feel like you're on the back foot and every scrape is a desperate fight for survival. The fact that these encounters can balloon to include six or eight enemies at once, each of them trying to tear you limb from limb as you dodge, shoot, lay traps, slide and fire your bow, it's, it's just magic. Horizon Zero Dawn feels like it's staging these choreographed set piece encounters that feel like boss battles when they're really just regular ass encounters you'll bump into as you cruise the open world. Horizon Zero Dawn has a lot of problems, but its strengths far outweigh its weaknesses. You can tell that this was made with all the fiery passion of a talented game studio who had for years been forced to make a game that they no longer wanted to make. They were set free here, unchained, and the results are spectacular. If you can push through the more clunky and dated aspects of it, Horizon Zero Dawn is a must play. If you'd have told me that one of my games of the year would be a freebie that was thrown in with the purchase of a new video games console, I'd have been like, okay, uh, which game is it? Astro's Playroom is the best free thing to come with another thing since Kojima put a Metal Gear Solid 2 demo in Zone of Enders. I have no idea why the higher-ups at Sony chose to give this away for free, but they did, and it's just wonderful. Astro's Playroom is the latest offering from Japan Studios' Asobi team. Their previous work was Astrobot Rescue Mission, a PSVR exclusive that I didn't play, but I only heard the best things about it. Everyone who played it loved it, and it actually wound up on a few Game of the Year lists as well. My first exposure to Playroom was when I went to Sony's headquarters in Australia to go hands-on with the PS5, and I was talking to the Sony guy about what we were going to do, and he kept mentioning the game, and at one point I was like, listen, I don't really think it matters about the game, I'm just here to look at the console. By the end of the session, I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Part of Astrobot's impact rests in its role as a tech demo for the power of the PS5, most notably the DualSense controller. There were two next generation consoles released in 2020, but only one next generation controller, and Playroom perfectly showcased both the haptic feedback and the adaptive triggers. I remember the subtle way the vibration would change as I stepped over glass or sand or metal, allowing me to tell the difference between surfaces with my eyes closed. I remember feeling the haptic feedback push back against my press as I loaded springs or drew back bowstrings or piloted rocket ships. Astro's Playroom was the first and is still the best demonstration of how much potential the DualSense controller has. But that isn't why it's on my game of the year list. It's on my list because it's a fucking great game. These developers know how to make a brilliant imaginative platformer. Every new zone is bursting with such color and charm and personality. Every new area introduces innovative mechanics that riff so elegantly on the tools you have at your disposal. Every time you step through a portal, you feel as though you're stepping onto an amusement park ride, where for the next hour or so, you'll be glancing left and right with a big smile on your face like those stupid clowns at the sideshow. The cherry on top is the way that this game enshrines the PlayStation legacy in a way that's never been done before. There's over two decades of PlayStation history now, with so many amazing genre-defining and genre-expanding experiences that you couldn't play anywhere else. And yet, we don't think of PlayStation in the same way we do Nintendo. We view Nintendo's IP as part of this larger whole, where Sony's IP all feels like it stands separately. Astro's Playroom wasn't the first time we'd seen a unification like this, but it was by far the most meaningful, the most authentic, the most resonant. Playing through each level and spotting the cameos wasn't just fun easter egg hunting, it was a trip down memory lane, back to the formative childhood and teenage years where these titles forever etch themselves in our memories. Astro's Playroom is a true next-gen technical showcase, it's a brilliant platformer, and it's an intravenous feed of liquefied nostalgia. I genuinely cannot believe that Sony gave this away for free. When I first previewed Immortal Phoenix Rising, I said, and I quote, I don't think this is going to be a game of the year contender. Well, you can add that to the poorly aged things Twitter account because Immortal Phoenix Rising is absolutely one of the best things I played this year. Much like Horizon Zero Dawn, Immortal Phoenix Rising is exactly the open world map marker driven Ubisoft style game you think it is 
because it's made by Ubisoft. But I think this is such an important title in Ubisoft's portfolio because it serves as a response or a solution to so much of the corrosive bloat that defines Ubisoft's current suite of games. For Ubisoft, this generation has been the open world RPG light generation, where all of their franchises were homogenized by recycling structure, system, rewards, approaches to storytelling and map design. We used to speak so fondly of Assassin's Creed and Far Cry and Ghost Recon. Now it just feels like there's so many caveats to be applied to each of those franchises whenever we talk about them, as each new entry feels like its identity is held hostage by Ubisoft's basic instincts. Immortal Phoenix Rising is the first Ubisoft game since Mario Rabbids in 2017, where you don't have to apply any caveats or qualifications to your love of it. You can just say, this fucking rocks, and you'll know that most people will agree with you, and even if they don't love it, they're gonna be happy that you do because Immortal Phoenix Rising feels like a genuine effort to make a cool, fun game that people will enjoy rather than some platform to drive monthly active users or sell XP boosters. The bedrock foundation for Immortal is the idea that everything you see should be new and different to the things you've seen before. That's why there's only a few zones, because that's all they could make while keeping them feeling unique and distinct. That's why each of the main quest arcs play out different to one another, with different characters, storylines, bosses to fight, mechanics to play around with, and puzzles to solve. That's why the final stretch of the game is totally different to the rest. Immortal Phoenix Rising has a total playtime of around 20 hours, and it never feels like it's wasting your time or padding things out. It feels so thrifty, so economical with the use of your time. And in a genre that so often feels drawn out and bloated, Immortal Phoenix Rising hits just right. It also doesn't hurt that this is a very well-constructed game. Combat is tight and responsive and always enjoyable. There's a lot of expression possible within this combat system, as you string together different combos and movements and parries, the abilities often double as movement tools, allowing you to reposition yourself or the enemy in a way that makes you feel like you're always in control of the battlefield. Combat animations are also really fluid, making combat fun to watch, and enemies are designed with the right visual and audio telegraph so you can confidently outplay them as you become more accustomed to them. Now the humour isn't to everyone's taste, I know that, but they swung for the fences with a sense of personality here. The whole thing plays out like a Disney cartoon, which is rare in video games funnily enough. There aren't many Many games that are written like this, that present like this, that play like this. Yes, it looks like Breath of the Wild and it's structured like Breath of the Wild, but that's really where the similarities end, as Ubisoft have put an honest to goodness unique stamp on the open world genre here. For a publisher that has well and truly spanked this genre to the point where you feel like they couldn't possibly have any creative gas left in the tank, Immortal Phoenix Rising shows us that Ubisoft still has a few tricks left up their sleeve. And if they're smart, They'll double down on this stuff in the future because the universal acclaim that this game is currently receiving is too loud to wisely ignore. Supergiants Hades is the breakout smash hit of the year that no one saw coming, unless you've played previous Supergiant games and already knew that their commitment to stunning visuals, crisp writing and tight gameplay was par for the course. Even with this knowledge, Hades still stands out as Supergiant's finest work to date, being one of the best roguelikes ever, a success story in the often dubious world of early access, and a title that demonstrates the merits of crunch-free development in an industry that wants you to believe that crunch is a requirement. For many reasons, Hades is a very important game. Hades is a roguelike, or more specifically, a rogue light, because of the way its meta progression systems unlock new weapons and upgrades as you continue to play. As Zagreus, you're trying to escape your father's clutches and learn the truth about your mother, with each attempt eking out more exposition about you, your family, and the gods and demigods who each play some part in your journey. What I find most remarkable about Hades isn't its awesome gameplay and incredible visuals and banging soundtrack. It's how much story there is to discover. Most roguelikes, if they do have a story, it's pretty light on. In Hades, the overarching narrative, as well as dozens of sub-stories, will unfold over 50, 60, 80, 100 hours or more. I put 50 hours into the game, and I was still regularly surprised to hear new story beats from characters that I thought had well and truly told me everything they had to say. And I've heard from many others that have experienced the same thing at 100 hours or more. The writing that's gone into this, the voice acting, the sheer commitment to creating such an epic and yet subtle tale is truly remarkable, especially when you consider that Supergiant are only a team of like 20 people. I think the context in which Hades was made is almost as important as the game itself. Hades launched in early access in 2018, and since then Supergiant has consistently worked with its community to add to and refine the game. When it arrived, it was finished. 
It had all the promised content and it all worked. This sounds like a low bar, but this is one that many games, particularly AAA games, struggle to meet. There's a lot of skepticism about early access titles taking your money before a game is finished, but I think we're at a point where there are enough success stories in the mix that major developers need to start adopting this model. Like, you really want to tell me that Avengers wouldn't have been a better game if it had an 18 month early access period before launch? This is a model that needs to be adopted more broadly across the industry, and Hades shows us why. It also shows us how important it is to protect developers. In a moment of stark irony, Naughty Dog won the Golden Joystick Studio of the Year award at the same time as stories of crunch culture at the studio were spilling out all over the internet. Naughty Dog is not alone in this. Most major studios either crunch a little or a lot, risking the health and well-being of the people who make the games we love. Supergiant have a strict no-crunch policy to the point where emails are banned after 5 p.m. on a Friday. These people got to live their lives while making one of the best games of the year. There's a paradigm shift needed in how games are made, and Hades provides a template in more ways than one. When we think about games we've played or loved, we typically recall the moments, experiences, and emotions we felt while playing them. We're remembering what it was like to interface with a game because that interface is over now. Games end and hence so too does our interaction with them. Kentucky Route Zero is a game, if we can call it that, where your real interface with it begins when you complete it because it's at that moment when you can stand back and view the totality of the work and begin to ask what it all could have meant. We call Kentucky Route Zero a game because we don't have any better means of describing it, but it's far closer to an interactive art installation or theatre production than it is a game. You can crudely smoosh it into the point and click adventure genre, but doing so is going to set up the wrong expectations about what this thing is, since there's almost no puzzles to solve and I certainly wouldn't call it an adventure. You might want to call it a walking sim, but you don't do a whole lot of walking. You might call it a visual novel, but it feels like far too restrictive a label for what this is. For now, we can just call it something else. Kentucky Route Zero is a five-act experience that chronicles the slow descent and decay of the American experience. From the freedom and independence of the open road and the Americana-inspired truck stop to the indentured servitude that is the inevitability of late-stage capitalism. From the normality of civil roadside conversation to the sprawling madness of the abstract underworld. Kentucky Route Zero definitely walks the tightrope separating allegory from metaphor tipping left and right into each of them without ever losing balance. Visually, Kentucky Route Zero is so arresting. It's rare that we talk about composition in video games, but here each frame feels like the question of composition was the starting point more than things like functionality or level design. Each scene lingers for so long that we get to drink up all of these details. You'll spend up to 30 minutes staring at these frames as cutscenes unfold, and so many of them become chiseled into your memory because of the confidence inherent in their static beauty. Kentucky Route Zero is not an experience I would recommend to anyone looking for a good time. Kentucky Route Zero is work. It's extremely slow. It's extremely sparse, expecting you to fill in many of the gaps in conversations and events. It's extremely depressing, as the wheels of capitalism and debt grind people and towns into dust in a way that feels immediately recognizable but utterly unavoidable. Kentucky Route Zero is an experience I would only recommend to you if you appreciate the feeling of disorientation, if you are comfortable being shown something without an anchor point to guide your interpretation of it. To play Kentucky Route Zero is to feel adrift, a feeling that will not go away when you finish it. There are no answers awaiting you at the end. This isn't a Christopher Nolan film where all the pieces fall into place in the final act. This is community theatre, where the lights go dark and the six people that were watching the entertainment aren't sure what they just saw, or even if they liked it, but they definitely saw something, and now they get to talk amongst themselves about what that thing is. I didn't play the first Ori, at least not much of it. I remarked it from afar for its beauty and I saw how much affection it engendered in those that played it, but I never made the time for it. So when the sequel released early this year, I said there is no way I'm missing out on this. And wow, what, what a game. Ori and the Will of the Wisps is such a stunning, stunning game to look at. It's astounding how much detail has gone into every pixel on screen. Hand-drawn, stunningly animated, incredible depth of field that makes each world feel like it extends forever behind you. Every frame just feels like a picture, you just want to frame it and put it on your wall. 
But I already knew that it was this beautiful stepping into it because I'd seen footage of the previous game. What I didn't know and what I didn't expect was just how well it would play. This is a very well-built Metroidvania platformer. Ori is a dream to control even at the start of the game owing to tight controls and detailed animations. Later on though, as you unlock more and more of the movement abilities, controlling Ori is like steering the wind. Everything just flows so naturally, and with enough practice you'll be able to achieve this flow state that I just love in games. The boss encounters almost all begin with a gauntlet style challenge that pushes you into this flow state, and they push you really hard because there's so much room for mastery within Ori's movement kit. It's not just the movement though, it's also the combat. This is a challenging game, far more than I expected it to be. I liken it to Hollow Knight, which if you've played, you know is definitely tricky at times. You're not just avoiding or fleeing danger here, you're facing it head on, and the various combat abilities you have at your disposal make combat feel just as satisfying as traversal is. The boss battles are such standouts. I really struggle to think of more interesting boss encounters I have faced in 2D platformers. They are just so epic and so clever and so challenging and I just loved every one of them. I looked forward to each of them as I felt myself drawing closer to the end of each area. Truly a standout achievement in the world of 2D platforming. Ori is also a deceptively deep game when it comes to its structure. It's an open world 2D platformer where you can go almost anywhere you want after unlocking the central hub. The world is populated with NPCs, many of whom will offer you optional side quests sending you to new parts of the map that offer up more demanding challenges. There's a skill tree that allows you to customize your approach to combat and an upgrade system making you more effective in the ways you wish to play. Ori is an open world game and a 2D platformer and an RPG light and all of its pieces are as fleshed out and as essential as each other. The thing that holds it all together though is how moving it is. With so few words, Ori and the Will of the Wisps finds a way to create a connection between you and the characters you meet and moments of triumph and loss are felt so poignantly. It has the same emotional resonance that Journey did or Gris or Pixar films do. And as you walk away from Ori, your strongest remembrances won't be the clever level design or the tricksy gauntlet challenges, but the emotions you felt as you made your way through a world that is built on the never-ending cycle of decay and regeneration, of death and rebirth. Ori is as moving as it is clever and beautiful, and it's absolutely one of the finest platformers ever made. Now I know what you're thinking, how could this guy put Risk of Rain 2 higher on his list than Hades, when Hades is clearly the better game? Well look, you're partly right, on balance, I do think Hades is a better game. It reaches for more, it accomplishes more, but this is my list, damn it, and I liked Risk of Rain 2 better. Like Hades, Risk of Rain 2 is another early access roguelike from a small studio, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Where Hades is ancient Greek mythology, Risk of Rain 2 is sci-fi. Where Hades is a drip feed of narrative exposition, Risk of Rain 2 has no story, just some lore to dig around in should you choose to target those threads. Where Hades is all about the meta progression both mechanically and narratively, Risk of Rain 2 is closer to a classic roguelike where each of your runs stand distinct from one another. And this is ultimately what I really appreciated about Risk of Rain 2. I came back to it many times after having reviewed it because it slots so neatly into my life. I could pick it up for as little as a few minutes and I would get what I wanted out of it. There was no time investment required, no long game to work towards. It was this instant gratification that was also really low stakes because I could just turn it off at any point and not feel like I missed out on anything. That might sound disparaging, but it's the opposite. Every moment of Risk of Rain 2 is so self-contained and self-confident that the game doesn't feel like it needs to dangle any carrots in front of you to keep you playing. You play it when you want to play it, and you stop when you want to stop, and you rarely feel disappointed by it. Risk of Rain 2's combat is deceptively complex and deep. I think many who come to it will find it mechanically unrewarding, and I think that's a fair comment if you're looking for complex combos or upgrades that drastically change your playstyle. Where Risk of Rain 2 is strongest is in its class design, where each of the 10 classes play completely differently from one another, be that in their movement or the way they deal damage. Hidden within each of these kits are really, really specific mechanics that only advanced players are going to be able to master. 
This is a very stat-driven game, and if you spend the time to research what makes each character tick, you'll find they are anything but simple or one note. The thing I love most about Risk of Rain 2 though isn't its detailed mechanics or its huge pool of upgrades or the way that all of them scale pretty much endlessly. It isn't the combat which somehow always manages to make sense and remain clear no matter how much on-screen chaos there is. What I love most about Risk of Rain 2 is the ethereal quality that it has. All of the characters are so weird looking. All of the environments are so alien and distinct from one another. All of the enemies feel pulled from dreams or nightmares. They, they don't make any sense. This game feels like its pieces don't belong together. And that's how a dream feels. An impossible combination of things strung together and your mind jumps frenetically between all of it trying to make sense of it. That's what Risk of Rain 2 does for me. It makes me feel like I'm in this weird haze where I can kind of just zone out and explode everything and listen to one of the most banging soundtracks that 2020 has to offer. All right, let's pause here for a second. In years past, I've always had a very clear view of what my game of the year was. Like there was no question in my mind that The Outer Wilds was the best thing I played in 2019. Even though Red Dead 2 was extraordinary, I never doubted that the best thing I played in 2018 was God of War. Same goes for Breath of the Wild in 2017. This year, I find myself in a position where I don't think there was one game that stood head and shoulders above the rest. There are three games that I liked equally for very different reasons, and forcing them into an order for the sake of consistency seems silly. So, here are my three favourite games of 2020 in no particular order. I really can't believe how much Square Enix absolutely nailed the remake of Final Fantasy VII. I was a teary-eyed nerd watching E3 when the Buster Sword came into view and the remake was revealed to the world. I followed its development, the question marks, the delays, the sundering of the game into multiple parts. I played Final Fantasy XIII, which was not great. Most importantly, I had played Final Fantasy XV, which was a train wreck that was only saved by the boy band Bonds of Fellowship and my soft spot for cup noodles. <laughs> Point is, with the exception of Final Fantasy XIV, Squeenix had not been on a good run and everyone held their breath to see how Final Fantasy VII Remake would land. The sigh of relief I felt whilst playing it was euphoric. Final Fantasy VII Remake was such a joy to play through from start to finish and I was so impressed at the boldness of its changes and how well each of those changes were implemented. The biggest change was the splitting of the story into multiple games. You can get through Midgard in around 5 or 6 hours in the original but here in the remake the entire first game is set in Midgard and it takes you like 30 hours to get through. You'd think that a lot of padding would be required to pull this off, but what Squeenix did instead was spend far more time with each character, deepening your relationship to them. The game does play out as a protracted dating sim, where Tifa, Eris, and Jesse all spend a large portion of the game leading you by the nose and mercilessly flirting with you until, you know, your dates get interrupted when you have to go save the world. The extra time with the characters is priceless and will surely melt the heart of even the most ardent skeptics. The same cannot be said of the remake's approach to open world design. Final Fantasy XIII copped a lot of flack for being a corridor simulator, and VII Remake was little different except it managed to conceal the corridors better, but there are still some of the worst parts of XIII and XV in here. The biggest thing that obscures these issues is the combat, which is an utterly brilliant refreshing of the classic turn-based formula. This is still turn-based, sort of, it's just that Squeenix have figured out how to fill the dead space between the turns with real-time action combat that fills your ATB. The fact that you can control any character at any time and switch between them seamlessly, and they all play so differently and so wonderfully, Final Fantasy VII Remake is a true high point for JRPG combat, and we're very likely to see other games riff extensively on this formula in the future. Much fanfare was made of the game's controversial ending, which provided a subtle but significant shift to the way the remake was positioning itself against the original. In hindsight, it feels as though much of this outrage was overblown because we don't know what comes next. Nomura could go full Nomura and utterly ruin it, or someone could be like, dude, stop, and then everything will be fine. 
Personally, I expect they'll land it. The biggest achievement of the Final Fantasy VII Remake was the complete rebuilding of one of the most iconic video games ever made, modernizing every part of it without losing any of the magic that made the original so special. It's a feat that few games or films have been able to accomplish, so it looks like Final Fantasy VII is in very good hands. I never played Wasteland 1 or 2, but I heard they were pretty cool. This is, after all, the series that kickstarted Fallout, so there had to be something good in there. Wasteland 3 kind of snuck in under the radar this year, since it's kind of niche and it didn't have a huge marketing budget behind it, and it had been a long time since Wasteland 2, so no one really knew what to expect. This is the best RPG I played this year, hands down nothing comes close. So if this is the first you've heard about Wasteland, imagine isometric Fallout meets XCOM. So you're in the post-apocalypse and everyone's a little bit crazy, but society is getting on as best it can. And you're a Wasteland Wanderer type quest to make choices that affect both yourself and the world around you. And it's really the decision-making that makes Wasteland 3 so exceptional. Most RPGs that you play are built around very little choice or fake choice or choice that only really affects you and your party rather than the world as a whole. So stuff like the Outer Worlds or Cyberpunk are good examples where you're offered plenty of choices along the way, but the decisions you make aren't going to be felt in any meaningful way. The branching paths before you are not so branching and the world certainly doesn't evolve to reflect your choices. Wasteland 3 is one of the most responsive RPGs you'll play because the choices you make affect you just as much as they affect the broader world. You will choose who to align with or betray, and your standing with different factions will ebb and flow, granting you access to play paths that would be otherwise unavailable. You will choose whether certain factions live or die, deleting them entirely from the map should you choose, and that decision will reverberate throughout the rest of the game as other factions take note of the way you solve problems. It's difficult to make a significant choice in Wasteland 3 without that choice having vast flow on impacts that you cannot predict. Making decisions in this world is perilous because you're almost always going to be pissing someone off and it's just a matter of time before they catch up to you. Wasteland 3 is equally strong in its XCOM-style tactics gameplay. Its fluid class system and flexible build diversity give you dozens of ways to approach combat, and the game is precisely tuned to be consistently challenging. And that's not easy to do, by the way. XCOM and games like it really tightly control build diversity and weapons and abilities, so it's much easier for them to calibrate difficulty against that. Wasteland offers so much more flexibility, and yet they still manage to keep things feeling tough but fair. In addition to being a first-class RPG, Wasteland 3 is also a first-class tactics game. The cherry on top is how well-written this all is, how imaginative, how funny, how interesting. You know how Borderlands is like Fallout if it were really dumb? Wasteland is like Fallout if it were really smart. The Americana, the gallows humor, the subtlety of its social and political structures, the faction of rednecks who worship an AI version of Ronald Reagan as their god. Wasteland 3 is at least 50 hours long, and it always kept me interested in what was going on and eager to push on to the next big reveal. I'm pretty judicious with my time these days, and I rarely play games till like 2 or 3 a.m. because I try and focus on getting a good night's sleep. Wasteland 3 was the only game this year where I was like, fuck that rule, and I would just basically play until I fell asleep on my keyboard. This is super, super good. It absolutely deserves your attention, and it's on Game Pass, so you have no excuse. Please, please, please play Wasteland 3. Listen, we all know Ghost of Tsushima is a good game, okay? I've said it like a dozen times in various videos. It was definitely one of the best things I've played this year. It's fantastic. I love it. We know that. So let me talk about something else here, which is going to be a little weird, but bear with me because hopefully it will be a little more interesting than me telling you what you've already heard a hundred times. As I said earlier, this generation was the open world game generation where we just had so many of these types of games and they all sort of build on each other and borrow ideas and refine things. Games are no different from technology where you don't get the Valve Index without the first Oculus and you don't get that without the Virtual Boy. Now, I actually divide open world games into two categories. There's the Ubisoft stuff and the Witcher stuff and the Days Gone stuff and the Horizon Zero Dawn stuff, the map market driven games that have defined much of this generation. The other camp is the Breath of the Wild and the Outer Wilds, which are games built on the philosophy of curiosity driven exploration. There are no map markers here, 
Instead, the game shows you something in the distance or some broken tablet or NPC hints at it and you head towards that thing, completely unawares of what you'll find when you get there. Ghost of Tsushima is an extremely refined Ubisoft game, and I don't mean that pejoratively. I absolutely loved Ghost of Tsushima. The art direction is stunning. The multi-staged arcs of the side quests kept me invested in every part of the story. The quality of life features make playing it seem so effortless. And the combat is unbelievably good. Where Horizon Zero Dawn achieves greatness through scale and ferocity, Ghost of Tsushima achieves it through intimacy and discipline. The blade sheathed and then released. The autumn leaves falling as you duel to the death. Make no mistake about what I'm saying here, Ghost of Tsushima is a truly extraordinary game. Part of the reason I don't have a single game of the year this year is because when I think about these sorts of lists and we get to the pointy end, like the top five or whatever, I'm really drawn to innovation more than anything else. I feel like if something is ambitious and new but a little clunky, I'm generally going to rank that higher than something that's derivative but really well executed. When we talk about Ghost of Tsushima, I think the discourse has settled on the idea that it doesn't really do anything new, it just does existing stuff really well. And I think that's true. In fact, I think it's so true that Ghost of Tsushima is so good that I really find myself wondering, well, what else do you do with this formula? Where, where do you go next? It feels like Ghost of Tsushima is so refined and capable in everything that this genre sets out to achieve that I think less about how to fix the problems in Ghost of Tsushima because there's not really any problems, and I think more about how to fix the problems inherent in this style of open world game. And this brings me back to the Breath of the Wild and the Outer Wilds, games that offer a template for how this genre could evolve. What if the next big AAA open world action game had no map markers, and you had to talk to NPCs to find where stuff was? What if all the bullshit and busy work was stripped out and you just created space worth exploring? What if there were no tutorials and you just had to figure out stuff as you went? Like immersive sims, what if the world was governed by the immutable laws of physics and the solutions to puzzles lay not in finding keys, but in applying our common sense and deductive thinking? I'm spouting a lot of bullshit here, I know that, but my point is, we've been playing this sort of game for a long time now. I think Ghost of Tsushima was the best version of that game we've ever seen, and perhaps will ever see. So rather than trying to top that, I kind of hope developers strike out in a different direction and reshape this genre once again. That's a pretty weird way of saying that Ghost of Tsushima was one of my games of the year, but there it is. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. 2020 is a wrap. What a great year. Am I right? Nothing bad happened in 2020, and it's looking like nothing bad is going to happen in 2021 either. I, for one, am grateful that I got to play some games and talk about them with you guys. So thank you for being cool and putting up with my hot takes. Thank you to my patrons who allow me to do what I do. Thank you to NVIDIA for sponsoring this video, and don't forget to click the link and hopefully get yourself an RTX 3080. That'd be a nice way to start 2021. For now, guys, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down, so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing, and if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.